welcome to another Rock My Age podcast in our series of Inspiring Women, Conversations with Inspiring Women. And um, recently I have been doing a number of podcasts around the idea of creating non-traditional families. We spoke with Natalie Sutherland on surrogacy. We spoke with Lauren Cross on uh, creating a family through egg donation. And I'm delighted today to speak with uh, Maggie Reynolds, Margaret Reynolds, um, otherwise known as Peggy. And I will refer to Margaret as uh, Peggy throughout the podcast. Um, Margaret is an author, uh, she's a writer, academic, uh, broadcaster and a critic. And she has recently uh, written a book which actually came out last month called The Wild Track. It's her journey of adoption of her daughter, Lucy, which took seven years. And um, we'll talk about that and the challenges that uh, Peggy went through. And the book's about adopting, mothering and belonging. And I really resonated with so many themes in this book, not just because I'm a mother, but actually there are so many beautiful themes about this idea of the wild track and being fully present, um, not just as a mother, but in life in general. But it was a fascinating book and I really enjoyed reading it, uh, Margaret, uh, uh, Peggy. And also I think it was fascinating that it was both um, fact and, and a, a, a sort of biography or biographical, which I really enjoyed as well, because it was very informative but also, you know, really written from the heart. So welcome, uh, Peggy. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so should we just sort of kick off a little bit on, I love the idea of the wild track and um, this idea of how this links to pause and silence and presence and really listening in. Would you just share with us, you know, what that meant for you, the wild track, and, and how that kind of related and threaded through the journey for you? Yes, I, I uh, um, have done a lot of broadcasting, uh, both television and radio, but mainly radio. And I really love radio because, uh, you know, the inflection of voices, what you juxtapose in terms of music, uh, imagery, uh, sound, you know, bird song, for instance, natural sounds, um, is something that really attracts me. And um, I had a program for Radio 4 called Adventures in Poetry. Uh, so I did that for many, many years. Um, but I had my, my first experience of encountering this idea of wild track uh, was, it, it, the whole thing was very extraordinary, actually. Um, I was making a program uh, with uh, producer Nikki Paxman about the Virgin Mary in art. And we had gone to interview John Taverner, the composer. Uh, and he, you know, was a deeply spiritual man uh, with a great sense of uh, religious attention in just the way that he behaved and thought. And of course, all of that was overlapping into his music. So we went to interview him and because he was very serious and as I say very spiritual, the whole experience of interviewing him was quite contained and calming and really rather beautiful. Um, not just his thoughts, but his voice, his presence, everything. And at the end, when we'd finished the interview, my producer said, OK, I'll just record a bit of Wild Track. And I had this was one of my earliest broadcasts. I had no idea what this was. And literally, because sound is changed by space, so you have to record the same sound in the same space, exactly the same bodies. You can't, if, you, if somebody moved their chair, the ambient sound would be slightly different. So we're all sitting there, the three of us, in silence, while my producer just holds up her fluffy microphone, you know. And I just thought this was amazing that all we were doing was you know, contemplating life, contemplating the present moment. And that's why I decided to use this as the title for the book, because I didn't know much about adoption when I started off on this route. I knew comparatively few people who had been adopted and fewer still who had adopted children. So I had to learn. So I had to bring that listening presence and that conviction, and indeed, yes, I dare I say spirituality, to the whole process to help me through the many difficulties that I was to encounter. And that idea of being um, present doesn't just allow you to hear, does it, and listen. 
but it actually allows other people to be able to grow in that space as well. You talk a lot about that, giving Lucy the space very much when you first adopted her um, to be able to grow into a relationship with you. And I felt very much that you held that space um, in, in also that beautiful silence or spirituality. I, I really felt that when you, when you exp expressed that. Yes, interestingly, Erica, people, when they talk about adoption, they often talk about love. They often talk about, you know, children needing love and I really want to love them and I fell in love and all this sort of stuff. And I realized after I'd written it that I did not use the word love mm -hmm. once. Mm -hmm. It's there and I speak about it in kind of uh, uh, through codes um, by referring to other books very often, by using other people's passages. Um, because actually more important than that is paying attention. I'm not saying that I have always succeeded. <laughs> you know, it, 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 um, there are a lot of failures along the way. I have to admit that. But especially in those early days, that paying attention, because, you know, I, I, knew, ab I knew about my daughter because I'd read a lot of paperwork. I'd been told various things, but I had never set eyes on her until long after I had signed the paperwork um, and agreed to undertake this. So she was a stranger to me, but even more to the point, I was a stranger to her because she was only six. She had no real explanation from the social workers or anything, anybody else about what was happening to her. She had no experience in her life because she'd often been moved. Um, about consistency or sameness. So she could not really begin to imagine what was going to happen to her. And so therefore, in those early days, yes, I was very conscious of the fact that I had to hold back and just wait. And a very simple example, I never said, give me a hug or give me a kiss or anything like that. And when I introduced gradually, after Lucy had been living, living with me for a little while, I introduced her to my mother and my brother and his wife and their baby son, you know. And I, before I did that, I said to them, and don't ask Lucy for a kiss or a hug or anything. You know, we have to go at her pace. And they very sweetly did that. And she, interestingly, it was the other way around. She owned them very fast, called my mother Gran, you know, wrote nice thank you notes, all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, that paying attention was something that actually helped, you know, help with, uh, was really useful to me throughout this experience. <clears throat> I always remember that saying, actually, it's funny, as you were saying that, it, I recalled it, which is the greatest gift you can give anyone is your fullest attention. Um, and I do remember that often with my son, actually, as he was growing up. One of the things you just talked about there um, was this idea of, um, you know, Lucy had moved around a lot, different families, foster families, before you adopted her. And I think you also talk about your own journey when you were young of moving a lot. Um, you, before you adopted Lucy or during that process, you um, purchased two cottages in the Cotswolds which is now your home and you're actually sitting in it, which is beautiful. So we can <laughs> imagine that as we talk. Um, can you, before we sort of talk about the, the technical aspects of adoption and the process you went through and the challenges, I'd love to just talk about that piece about the, the home and the belonging. And you, you talk a lot about creating that home for her, but not having even met her. And so trying to kind of instinctively, intuitively create something um, you hadn't been a mother before either. So I'm fascinated with that idea of home and belonging and the fact that you had both moved a lot in your childhood and what that has now meant to you as you've, you know, you've created your family and, and Lucy has grown up. Yes, because when I, when I uh, began to um, think that I, well, first of all, just that I wanted a child and that therefore, you know, for practical reasons, I was single, I'd already been through the menopause as quite a young woman in my thirties. For practical reasons, a biological child was really, you know, out of the question. So I pretty soon came to the conclusion that I would adopt. And this made me begin to think about myself and my own situation. 
And yes, Erica, as you say, I was born in Australia and my parents moved to England when I was a child, when I was 11. And even while we were in Australia, we moved around a lot. We never stayed anywhere for more than two years. So immediately I, I realized that this was something that had really formed my identity, this always moving and being what I now recognize as a child migrant, that I was a child migrant. Um, and um, I, I, I had to acknowledge the ways that that had turned me into the person I am. And, you know, during the home study, you talk to a social worker a lot. And I mentioned all of this and bless her, she said to me, well, that's a strength because the likelihood is that this child too will have, well, obviously they'll have lost their home, but they may have moved around a lot. So you will be able to understand and comprehend that and to some degree share that with them, share that experience. Um, so yes, so, so I was very clear to me that, you know, I as a you know, grown up, somebody in my forties, desperately needed to sort this out, to find a place that I belong to, not just a house and a garden and, you know, <laughs> the dog, the cats, <laughs> the hens, um, but a community. So I live in a village, everybody knows me, everybody knows what's going on in my life. I don't mind that. Well, I have political differences with some of them, but we're still very close. Um, and that community was very important to me in creating that home for Lucy. And so to some extent, of course, you're, you know, it is a kind of a fantasy. So I'm thinking, oh, well, what would I have liked as a child? Mm. So a bit of that is creating that. Mm. Um, but then, as we've just said, then it's listening to that individual. Mm. And every child is different, whether it's your biological child or, or not. Mm. They're all themselves. And paying attention to that is what matters. Mm. No, and it really, when, as you read the book, I could really imagine the house and the garden and, you know, when she, when she first arrived and everything, it was, it was just, you know, you could really picture it. So thank you for that beautiful description. You mentioned there about the why, um, you know, going through menopause early um, and that you had a real instinctive sense, you said that, yes, you know, I do want to have a child. Um, can you talk a little bit about that adoption process? You talked there about the home study, which, listening to your book sounded absolutely brutal uh it, it very tough to go through and it took you know there were a lot of challenges along the way from kind of looking at i think you called it cross-border adoption to ending up doing um, domestic adoption um it was a really tough process that you went through particularly perhaps as a single a mother to be um be useful perhaps just to share a little bit of that and then i'd love to come on um to you know to, to the process of the transition for lucy and 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 how that was for her Sure. Yes. Yes. Um, I have one friend, a dear friend of mine, who does have an adopted daughter. And she says that the social workers who uh, uh, inspect you, carry out the home study, preparing you for adoption, begin with the proposition that you are an axe murderer. Now, <laughs> that's a little bit extreme. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously she said that to me privately. It's not quite like that. But their first concern, adoption is first of all, a service for the child. Mm. They are the most important person. Um, so their first concern is the child's safety and well-being. So of course, I completely understand that you need to go through a very thorough process of recognizing what your motives were, uh, what your uh, understanding of what this is going to entail are, um, how prepared you are, because there will be difficulties and there are difficulties. Um, so all of those things have to be gone over. But, you know, they do ask very searching questions about like your relationship with your own parents. And that often can stir up a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. let alone, you know, your attitude to your past relationships, plus all the practical things like your finances, your employment situation, your health, you know, because of course they have to know that all of those are in place. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it seems very difficult. Sometimes health questions even now get raised um, about prospective adoptive parents, but clearly um, the, the social workers do not want to place a child with somebody who is then 
you know, sadly going to die in a few years time. It's very important that a child should have length of time and security and consistency. So yes, in that sense, it is, it is very brutal. And you do have to be very honest and really look into yourself um, in that process. Um, I am, of course, Erica, talking about something that happened quite a long time ago. I did this at the beginning of the 20th, 21st century. Um, a lot has happened in uh, adoption services since then. And a lot of attitudes have changed to uh, what kind of people might be suitable prospective adopters, uh, prospective adoptive parents. And I've had dealings very recently with um, a couple of groups of social workers. And I was very impressed by uh, new regulations and, and indeed new attitudes. So if anybody were listening, thinking about this, um, it's not quite as ferocious as my own experience. And there is a point and a purpose to it all. Interesting. And um, actually that links a, a little bit perhaps to this idea of, um, you know, that, that um, Lucy herself talks towards the end of the book, which I thought was wonderful. You gave Lucy a voice uh, towards the end of the book around her experience. And um, you yourself talk about the difficulty of, of going to pick her up from the foster parents and bringing her home. But Lucy also gives her voice to that and the, mm -hmm. the, the harsh um, ripping and tearing of that. You mentioned a little bit earlier in our conversation that, you know, often the child isn't given or wasn't at that time given the, enough information about why this was happening and what was going to happen and perhaps how um and so it was it felt like in reading the words yours and Lucy's that it was quite a shock to her a real shock and shock to her system it, it, could you share perhaps the, from your perspective and then from Lucy's perspective just so that people that are listening can understand that complexity and kind of quite, what was to me quite heart-wrenching reading it Yes, yes. It was interesting, Erica, because um, this whole book came about because after my daughter came to live with me, I used to just jot down things, uh, things that happened and things, my thoughts about my, my own family, my own experience, etc. And I'd kind of put it all together and I showed it to somebody who said to me, and this was about two years ago, so Lucy would have been 16 at the time then. And this person said to me, don't you think Lucy should have a voice? And I thought, Politically, ethically, morally, of course she should. So with a lot of trepidation, I went to her and said, how do you feel about writing something? And she thought about it very seriously. She is a very uh, um, conscientious person, um, but she agreed. And we decided together that we would both write our versions of the first day. So for me as an adult, I just had to get through this. I literally had to appear at the foster carer's home at eight o'clock in the morning, collect her and leave. And they kind of told you to do that as well, didn't they? They said, you must just pick her up, don't look back, don't do this. You know, they were quite strict with you, weren't they? Absolutely, because of course they've seen it all before and they know, they knew, they didn't tell me, but they knew perfectly well how difficult and traumatic this was going to be for a child. Because children always like what they know, even if it's not completely satisfactory. Even as adults. Familiarity, well, we all do, yeah. Familiarity counts for a great deal, doesn't it? So for me, all I was worried about were the practicalities, you know, where I was going to park, uh, how I was going to get from A to B, you know, what, what, making sure I got there on time, that sort of stuff. But for Lucy, it was a massive, terrible, terrible wrench. And um, it's, it's, it's very interesting because of course I know her, I know her as who she is. And, she, and, and, and children, are, you know, other people are so surprising, aren't they? Because actually the way she writes this, um, and a lot of readers have commented upon this, is very bold, very plain, very direct. And therefore, yes, I think it comes across as, as extremely painful. But when that was what we ended up with, both of us, and perhaps for Lucy even more than for me, she does not want that saccharine version out there. She does not want that sweet, happy version out there. 
she's thinking particularly, and I've heard her say this, um, of other children in a similar position who think, well, that, it wasn't happy for me, so why, what's so weird about me? So she wanted to say how difficult it is, how sad it is, how painful it is, as a way of indicating to other children going through similar experiences that that is what they can expect and that is the truth of it. So speaking, you know, telling that story became enormously important to both of us. And do you know, it's very interesting. As I say, I knew morally, ethically, philosophically, it was the right thing to do. But since then I've spoken to people who've read the book and who said to me, and I can think of one person in particular who was herself, she's grown up, you know, well and truly, but she was herself adopted. And she said, as an adoptive person, albeit a much older one, I would have been deeply disappointed if this book had not taken account of Lucy's voice. Um, though I have to say it's very unusual. Most adoption stories end when the child arrives in your home and that's the happy ending. But of course, that's only the beginning. And you do talk, and Lucy says actually right at the end of her piece, um, <clears throat> I really hope, Mum, that people will listen more to um, and be aware more of, of this process for the child. And you said that, um, you know, this did happen quite some time ago in your process and things have improved, but it feels like there's work that you and Lucy are doing and, and, and want to do um, to raise awareness of, of the experience for the child. Would that be fair? Yes, th that is absolutely right, Erica, yes. Um, Lucy, as you rightly say, Lucy herself wrote that section, wrote those questions um, and feels very much that there is a, yeah, you know, a, a polemical, a political aspect to, to the work that we have done because one does hear, um, and of course, you know, sometimes adoptive placements do not work and there are terrible stories out there, but so many children, uh, you know, there are 80, just over 80,000 children in care in England at present of whom it well you know in in last year that mean i mean march 2020 of whom only uh, just under 3500 would be adopted which so that's a minuscule and not all of them would be you know uh, would not for all of them would adoption be appropriate many of them will be able to go back to their birth families but that still leaves an awful lot and a great number of these children do not live in foster homes they actually grow up in residential care homes and so this sense of, you know, the possibility that these are difficult beginnings, but that is not destiny. You know, these children could have amazingly bright, fantastic futures if they were just given the right opportunities. And that is something that Lucy feels very strongly about and that I feel strongly about too. Um, she currently works for a, a, a charity based in London called Body and Soul, which works with people who have experienced trauma of whatever kind. Um, and in particular, they deal a lot with care experienced children and young people. Um, so for her, being able to take her own knowledge and her own capacities into helping and working others with others in that way is very important. And we both very much feel that our story, the story that's in this book, might also help to bring this to everybody's attention. That's a, yeah, I think that's, that's wonderful that she's actually taken that through on her journey, isn't it? And as you say, the book, um, I'm sure will uh, you know, be really powerful in, in getting that voice out there. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit now about um, where you are, not necessarily today, but the, the next chapter of the book talks about you, as Lucy has grown up a little bit, and your journey together to France, and um, your travel experiences together, and I got a real sense of friendship um, between the two of you, actually, might be the wrong word, but I, I felt that, um, and a sense almost of sort of intuitive, even though she's not your biological daughter, I felt, and you, you talked a little bit about almost like some of your interests and mannerisms. And I think it's fantastic to understand 
what we learn from our uh, our parents and what is genetic. And actually, Lauren Cross talks about this as a, a sort of as a non biological. Um, she's actually got three children through egg donation. And she said some of the mannerisms of her children came from, she saw from her, from their granddad, from her father, even though he wasn't the, bio, you know, the, bio, the biological um, thread. So I was just really interested in that because it, it, it felt like there was this real joy of friendship and I don't know, sort of a shared intimacy uh, between the two of you. Yes, and, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of people would imagine that that might not be possible given that, you know, we didn't have the experience of bonding when Lucy was a baby. She was six when she came to live with me, she had memories. But in a way, you know, I have come to see that as a strength because she has those memories and when she wishes to discuss it with me, then I listen and that, I incorporate that into my picture of who she is. And so in a way we have developed together this, you know, her learning about me, me learning about her. Um, actually, she says that reading this book taught her, showed her a lot of things about me that she didn't even know, even though I'm her mother, because it talks about my childhood and my past. And yes, I mean, you're, it, I, it's really true, honestly. Um, children are so funny, the way they pick up your expressions, your mannerisms, your, your way of telling a joke, you know, all of that sort of thing, as well as the, oh, mum, come off it, really, you know, <laughs> because we've all known that as well. Um, and, uh, and that is, oh, you know, that is, that is so interesting um, because that does build a real relationship. And it's true. I mean, Lucy would say that one of the, most, the, the best thing that, for her about, you know, her life with me is our, our traveling. We do like to travel together. You know, we do a lot of long distance journeys on trains um, and, and in cars. And, um, and yeah, that just, and, and I really like that. And it's taken me a while to work that out too, that we both really like that because of course the point is we are together, we're in the same space, but, and there's all that knowledge and, and past experience there, but we're in a different place. And we're kind of equal in that different place because neither of us knows exactly where we're going or why we're here or what we're after. Um, so it creates a different kind of dynamic in that process, I think. That's interesting. Um, yeah, but when you're in the yeah. home, it changes the dynamic of you're not the mother at home and she's not the daughter. You are two women, in a sense, on yes. the family. Precisely, precisely, with something that is much more shared and much more equal. That's that's the point, isn't it? I do have to say, I remember um, one social worker once a long time ago now saying to me, one of the best things that you can do for all children, but actually especially for adoptive children, is to travel a lot. Because they often think that their experience is an anomaly. Whereas if they see a lot of different lives, a lot of different people in different situations, they begin to realize that everybody is different. They're not the ones who are strange or an oddity. Everybody is different. And so actually, you know, maybe, maybe there is something in that. Um, of course, it also comes from my own past in that as a child, I traveled a lot, you know, my family were, were um, uh, inveterate travelers. Um, so yeah, that's something that's, that's, that's very powerful and that does bring us together. And of course, for me, it's very interesting as an older mother, I mean, you know, uh, I, I am 45 years older than Lucy is. So, you know, I'm at the, I'm at the, the older end <laughs> of motherhood, definitely. But as an older mother, it's, well, two things. When she was little, I used to kid myself that it made me look younger because I had a six-year-old in tow, you know, in my 40s, <laughs> in my 50s even. Um, but as she grows up and, you know, is applying to college and working out what she's going to do with her life and all that sort of thing, the strangest thing, and maybe all mothers experience this, is that I find myself going back to my own young days. I think a lot about them. And in a str strange kind of way, it gives that, it gives that sense of renewal of a new excitement in life um, and 
of course it's not happening to me but in a funny kind of way it is i was going to say how do you feel um peggy about that process i i know how i sort of felt my son going off to uni and you know he's back now um not back with me but uh you know in in the vicinity and and so but but how do you feel having gone through this process and her perhaps now stepping out and you know she went to uni and and what, what's your thought um well uh, obviously it's been it's uh, i it's it's difficult isn't it mm, yeah <laughs> i mean i'm not quite yet there yet because um although you know this has spent long time uh, periods away from home working um she hasn't quite gone to university i'm gonna have to deal with that but i know that i'm not alone you've obviously been through it other mothers go through it yeah. um it'll be very interesting yeah. but i'm ex you know the bottom line is i'm really excited for her yeah um i know that it will be you know amazing and of course as all young people at present you know she is so desperate to move on to the next stage of her life. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it'll be interesting and it'll be exciting for me too. Yeah, I completely understand that. I, I, it was funny, I sort of felt too, too ex when my son Tyler went to uni, I felt that as a single mother, we were, you know, and are very close because we, we you know, gone through our journey together. And, um, yeah. and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I really felt that wrench. I really did um, for, for a long time. And actually then when he moved out to live with his girlfriend, it was another wrench for me. It was funny, I thought I've done this. <laughs> I'm okay, I've gone through this. But actually it was another wrench. And then it was an even slightly different thing where I was like, so now I'm at a crossroads because I don't, I know that I'm not gonna have you know, anyone living with me again in that sense. Um, I'm single at the moment. What Now what? You know, I'm at a crossroads right now. Where do I want to live? How do I want to live? And it's it, to your point, you know, it's it's exciting for them. It's fantastic, but it's actually once we can go, go through the grief, which I think we have to. Um, what I, I did, oh, um, and to um, then think about the future, and to kind of begin to plan a life for you, uh, mm -hmm. with them in it, of course, but a different life, and that, and that can be quite tough, but also once you can get through to that exciting piece of it can be wonderful liberating actually yeah yes no i'm sure and you know don't worry erica i have plans um <laughs> you know obviously we'll still be we'll still be traveling together but i also have a friend that i went to uh, she's also single and uh, we went to india together you know many years ago with her daughter well you know what we'll just jolly well do that again <laughs> so yes, there are plans out there yeah, yeah. And I loved the piece um, when you were traveling together um, in France. I think you you stopped and sat at a lake or a view. Um, forgive me, I can't quite remember if it was a lake or view, but you both had almost an intuitive sense of this is where we're meant to be. Yeah. And I found that really profound in the sense that both sort of Yes, you were there in that moment together and fully present, but metaphorically, the journey that the two that brought the two of you together was exactly as it should have been. And, and I, I sense that that's, you know, more to come of that. Yes, I, I mean, in, in, in many ways, of course, there's no point in thinking you know, in life one one does not know where where you're going and in some ways well it's taking us back to this idea of the wild track you have to just see what happens and accept that the the, the place where you think you are, have arrived is going to be the right place to make something positive out of it um so yes yeah we, we were we were swimming in the river we'd lost our dog our dog is very important to us um <laughs> And uh, yeah, and we were we were together, and we were happy being in that place um, at that time. So that was that was a good moment, and it's treasuring those moments, isn't it? Um, Peggy, thank you so much. I think we kind of did a beautiful full circle there, back to the world track, didn't we? And that idea of um, mother, mothering, belonging, you know, the journey that you went through that brought you to that place. Um, thank you so much. Is there 
anything else that you would like to share? Um, you know, any sort of sense of, you know, today, you know, this is my sort of biggest learning of, of my whole process through this and, and where I am today um, as a mother uh, at home um, with this idea of a sort of sense of belonging. Anything else that would be important for you to share? I, 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 I think the one thing I would want to say is that, and I have said this um, many times, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy in my life, I am. I like my work, I like where I live. I like the experiences I've had in my life. Um, it has, as one friend said, once said to me, been very rich. <laughs> um, but the best thing, the single best thing has been being a mother, is being a mother. As I say, as I said earlier, I haven't always got it right. By no, by no means, but I know what I'm trying for. And I suppose that counts for a lot. Brilliant, Peggy, thank you so much. Um, as a reminder, the thank world- Thank you, Erica. <laughs> My pleasure, it's really been fascinating talking to you having read the book. So it's The Wild Trap, Margaret Reynolds. Peggy, a million thank yous. Thank um, you. Really wish you and Lucy the best with the book and with her journey through her university and, and your exciting adventures going on. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the conversation today. And if you'd like to listen to more conversations with inspiring women, do look at our website, rockmyage.com, or register to have them delivered direct to your inbox. Until next time.